Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob. Good to be back with you once again. We are in part two of our series here on forgiveness. So listeners really recommend that you go listen to part one, where I felt like last time Bob was a little bit more of a catechesis on forgiveness. It was, you know, we were trying to understand it. And, you know, it's funny, there's, we we're not recording these two back to back. So I went and Googled a little bit, just forgiveness. So I came across this article on psychology today. And I'm always interested to see what psychology, like, you know, it, this is kind of like the sports illustrated of sports or the, you know, time magazine of news or whatever. So psychology today. And what's amazing is that the entire article says, basically says forgiveness isn't necessary for healing. <laughs> and I was like, isn't this funny? It's like completely, but here's the unique part. Here's the unique, interesting thing. It goes through and basically says this, there's this concept that's going around. And I, what I thought was interesting is that it's very subtly getting after religion and Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, if you don't forgive, you'll forever have bitterness, et cetera. But what's really interesting is the entire time, if you listen to our episode, previous one, and then read the article, you go, she doesn't understand what forgiveness is. She's talking about reconciliation. Right. And she's going, why would you ever do that? That's ridiculous. That'd be so bad. And I'm going, that's not what <laughs> forgiveness is. <laughs> and you're a, you're supposed to be a, a smarty person. So it brought me back to the series on judgment and mercy uh, because yeah. during the article, she talks about having been in an abusive marriage and as a psychologist, then she goes on to explain her reasonings. And I thought, and, and, and in her, she says she has a book uh, that talks about dissolving a marriage with an abusive narcissist. Mm. I can see your face and I can see your nod. I know exactly what's going on in your head, right? And, and what was, what's interesting is I think we do this all the time where you hear that and you go, it makes sense now. Yeah. And some people go, well, don't judge. And I would say, we have to judge as long as we judge rightly, because that it informs right. mercy in what we do, right? So this is exactly the point. If you misunderstand all these previous episodes, then none of this makes sense. It sounds crazy. It sounds ridiculous. And I just thought, this is exactly what we're talking about. Psychology Today doesn't understand the concept between the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. And then it makes sense if you don't understand, like go be with an abusive person. No wonder she's, she's got real story, real pain yeah. there. No wonder this would be hard. No wonder she would say, are you guys crazy? I'm not going to just let him abuse me again. That's not what we're saying. So. Yeah. And, and not being inside of her own experience, my guess would be that she hasn't forgiven and hasn't healed. And look at the power. She's written an entire book on it. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the power, I think, of, you know, just to reference previous series of leaders. She's a leader in the in the psychology community. And and yeah. God bless her. This is not like yeah. a lot of people this, would hear yeah. what I'm saying right now and go, you are so judgmental. And my thought is, we again, we have to judge. If we don't have a position on anything, then anything goes. It's a basic yeah. philosophical principle. Yeah, there's no condemnation of her in either of our no. hearts. There's compassion for her, but it's 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 saying this is the kind of communication that's happening in the culture yes. that is not only misleading but ultimately destructive because it affects human lives. Yes, 
just like what you said, there's no condemnation in our hearts toward her. I, I feel for her. The pain she's likely in is significant. She's written a whole book about it. And, and that, yeah. and basically I'm imagining the book is talking about the pain that she went through, all legitimate, all completely legitimate. Reconciliation might not be possible with her ex-husband. And forgiveness is probably very difficult. Yeah because of the depth of the pain and the fears that's associated with forgiving. You know, it's like, do I open my heart again? And does that make me vulnerable again? Or right. is this letting him off the hook? Or is this yeah. uh, justifying what he's done? Or you know, And all those things really, really matter. And that's the thing yeah. I think when, when you and I talk about healing, what's scary about our version is it leaves no stone unturned. Yeah because of who the healer is yeah uh there's a there's a surrender and that's what's so hard about the christian message is we don't remain our own god and we surrender to someone else which inherently makes us vulnerable and at risk of being hurt yeah when i when i did a study of all the world's religions and philosophies not not exhaustive yeah, yeah. but just kind of surveyed them yeah. all that was the common denominator is in every other belief system, the individual person could stay in control and be God. Wow. Every philosophy, every religion, I, I'm not aware of another. Yes. You know, Even in Buddhism, it talks about dying to your desires. Yeah, like a desires. nihilistic self. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's still, e even though there's a dying process, there's still a, I'm in control of this process. Right. Just every, every belief system has that in common. It's that ungodly self-reliance. Mm. And in Christianity, if it's genuine, we can we can still live in that and call ourselves you Christian. Bet. But if it's genuine surrender to God and and openness to the Holy Spirit, it takes us out of our self reliance. And that, what like you said, that's vulnerable. Yes. You know, that's I'm not in control. Yes. And again, we we all have control places. Absolutely. But but the process of growing in communion with the Holy Spirit is letting go of those places, and that's what forgiveness is. Yes. And you know, it's funny, I imagine people can listen to this podcast. I mean, we've done enough episodes where people can probably pinpoint our woundedness pretty quickly. Yeah. And the point is, you're right. You're yeah. right. There's no defense. I have no defense. So I right. stand vulnerable before the reality that I am unwell. And the greatness of Christianity is that there's someone who cares about that, has the capacity to make me well and really wants to and draws near when it feels like everyone else goes away. And that's that's the hardest part for me is, well, if I stay in control, I can do the measuring act of how close everybody gets and I can quote unquote guarantee that I will be okay. So when you do this whole forgiveness thing, Jesus, or Restore the Glory podcast, like hold on, I'd prefer to get out of the driver's seat as the country song says jesus take the wheel like that is scary because what if he crashes or what if he puts me in a situation where i get run into you know trust trust control you know yeah i think we talked about crashing cars last time <laughs> oh no god <laughs> i don't know what the deal is here about crashing cars <laughs> anyway which by the way i was i got a new car after eight years and uh just the other my other one had a bumper you, you've yeah, seen I the have, bumper. yeah you did what'd you get uh, that's uh, a big deal i've ridden in the old car another another camera okay, yeah. okay. um I, I don't change much <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, just i was driving the other day on the way back from a meeting and a guy came into my lane and hit the side of my Come car on. And, and thank god it's not very much damage okay. but it would have stayed there for a while probably if it had been <laughs> That's so funny. Like that I'm, now I'm excited to come to our next conference and see your car. <laughs> I've known the old one for a while now. So you well, have, you that have. one has been retired. Okay. Um, yes. So today, Bob, we're, we're following up in part two of the series and we want to get way more practical. So listeners, what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through um, a whole process of forgiveness. A special gift to our patrons is that we're going to give them this process with a little more detail and some extra prayers and things that go with it. So, Bob, that was a shameless plug for Patreon, so <laughs> I had to do that. Um, anyway, so um, we're going to walk through this 13-step 
process. So yes, 13 steps, all of them important, and I think it'll flow and make sense. So that's where we're headed today. Is it in that right, Bob? Yeah. And uh, we're going to just talk through it and then we'll pray at the end to lead you through it. So Sounds great. Uh, it'll be a hopefully a very healing time. Yes. So let me just say a couple of things. Please. That one of the things that makes forgiveness difficult, and this is an idea from Dr. Ed Smith, yeah. is because we get attached to the wounds and the lies associated with those wounds mm. based in what's happened to us. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we touched on this a little bit last time. And so what we're going to pray through in this process is our judgments, mm. but we're going to have right judgment mm -hmm. about the real damage that's done. We're not going to whitewash it. It's just like this really did happen. It really did hurt. There was real impact. There was consequences to this. And I have emotions connected to that. And so we're going to acknowledge all of that, which is part of right judgment. Yes. And then we're going to address the faulty judgment, the con you know, the standing in pride above somebody, right. and work through that. Yes, and then we're going to work through the belief systems that we've internalized from the event, and renounce that and let Jesus meet us there. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to move from there into blessing and forgiveness. Bob, uh, again, I, I feel like we do this ad nauseum, but it's it's one of the things that's so important is essentially we're walking through the anatomy of a wound with yes. the uh, concept of forgiveness right in front of us. And so we, I, Bob, there's this phrase that I I've said recently, and this might, this is a little bit of a footnote, but I think it explains, it helps things. Like I heard this phrase and it says every system is, it was more of an organizational idea. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. Hmm. And then I changed it to every human is a perfect manifestation of what's going on in their heart. Wow. Yeah. So you can look at someone and go, this is, it's, it's a manifestation of what is happening in their heart. Just like it's perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. You look at a life and you go, this is a perfect manifestation of what's happening in their heart. Yeah. And all the decisions yeah. and events along yeah. the way. Wounds and blessings right. and joys and experiences and judgments and vows. And yeah, that's yeah. what it looks like right there. Yeah. 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 So, we, we continually reference that. So listeners, if you haven't caught on, that's like the secret sauce of healing is understanding that anatomy of the heart, really. We, we call it the anatomy of a wound, but the, it's, it's experience. It's the basic DNA of stuff that goes on in our world. So again, check that out if you want some more background on it. So, okay. 13, Bob. Um, I, I think, yeah, we number one, is an interesting one and very basic. So how about I'll take number one and we'll pass them on to, right. we'll go back and All forth. Right. So ask the Holy Spirit to show you who you need to forgive. It could be family, friend, abuser, God, yourself. Let's put a star next to God because that's an interesting one for folks. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you who you need to forgive. So Bob, right out of the gate, what we're noticing and what we're offering to people is this is a process that already we're not in the driver's seat. Yeah. So I'm noticing right out of the gate, there's a surrender that's going on. And so sometimes in this process, people can't even do step one because they're unwilling to hear what the Holy Spirit might say. Now, I, I've done this with people and you can, one of the ways you can tell is there's anxiety. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't even want to hear the answer to number one. And usually if you say, who are you afraid? God will say, yeah. <laughs> and, and then it's like, I, this, I do not want to go into that one, you know? That, yeah. yeah that's a, bingo. Yeah, bingo. Right. That, that might, that might be a good yeah. one. And sometimes I've noticed God in his kindness. It's, it's almost like he lets you go through the minor leagues before to the major leagues, you know? Yeah. 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 I remember we do this at every conference yeah. and it, Usually, I've led them sometimes, and Sister Miriam usually leads yeah. this part of the yeah. conference prayer, and uh, so I'm I'm usually in the one just praying through it each time, yeah. and uh, it's been so interesting oh. the times that it's the same person and the times that it's different people, but also the times when it's a series of people, and I get to see the linkage between those three places. It's like wow. I start with one person, and he begins to show me the link that the deeper unforgiveness is here wow. and the deeper 
wound is here in a third place. And it's like, wow. And I wouldn't have known that if the Holy Spirit had led in that you process. With the same person, you mean? Like it's the same person that goes deeper and deeper or no, different no, people? It's, it, I've done it sometimes where there's three different people oh. that I start with one person and then they show, oh, this is really here. Oh, oh wow. This is really Same here. kind of wound or dynamic. That's yeah, the thematic yeah. similarity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, my brother, my wife, my father, you know, just something like that. And it just progressively deeper levels of my yeah. heart. And I think one thing for the listeners to hear is that it's totally okay to hear the same person 10 times. Yeah. Uh, that is very common. You know, that that's one of my experiences is the same person ke can keep coming up and coming up. Bob, yeah. uh, like we mentioned God and I think people can like, I, I remember like there, uh, I've bumped into this numerous times and I'll give a stab at it then, you know, then hear your response. We're not forgiving God as if he's sinned or right. done something wrong. I, I love this. Sherry Waddell has this idea when she talks to uh, people who aren't believers and she, they go, I don't believe in God. And she says, tell me about this God you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. And then they mm -hmm. list off all these qualities and she says, I don't believe in that God either. Yeah. I'm right there with you because that's not actually yeah. who God is. And so what we're actually, when we say God, we're not talking about like, the true God, and this might, I, I'm not sure how you'll, you might have a different insight here, but it's, it's an impression that we have of God that's not actually who God is, but our heart believes that's who he is. I just was given a talk last night and I have this picture where I show a genie and a police officer. And I go, this is often our impressions of God. You know, he's giving us a ticket for going through life too fast and not doing it right. Or we hope that if we didn't get a ticket, we can get our three magic wishes from him. Yeah. Neither one of those yeah. are very good ways to relate to God because he's not a genie nor a police officer. That's good. So we would forgive that. Thoughts there? Yeah. I'm, it's very accurate to say we don't need to forgive God because God doesn't need forgiveness, but we need to release the perceptions and the hurt that we have from our dis disordered perceptions of God. And oftentimes, again, if we'll go deeper, there are authority figures in our life. Yeah that have created those distortions. So we're seeing God through a filter of authority in our life. It's so true. I mean, that's the, the catechism teaches that, Familiar's Consortio teaches that. But if you go through the process, yeah. which we will in a second, you'll see that we're actually walking again through the anatomy of a wound. And yeah. so the process isn't, it, it's getting into the details, you know, into the structures and organs and tissues, to use a medical analogy, of forgiveness instead of just this blanket you know, dynamic. So, yeah. So let me ask you a question before we walk right. into this. Why can't we just say, I forgive you and just move on? Uh, I don't know. I just, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it, it never works. <laughs> no. um, the one of the things that comes to mind is because I was reading about prayer, and this is a, a roundabout way of getting to it. And you know how you can just go, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name of the kingdom come, or you can pray it with your heart connected to it. Mm, there you go. The meaning and the efficacy, which would be a fancier word that's sometimes used in sacramental theology, is completely different. Mm -hmm. Because my heart is actually in what I'm doing. It's similar if, with, if you're exercising. Um, I've gone to physio before, and the, and the physiotherapist will say, okay, I want you to be conscious of your ankle. Mm. And that's different than not being conscious of your ankle while we're working on it. And, it, and what, what he's trying to do is help me have my connect to the area that's problematic because your brain needs to know that it's getting better. And mm -hmm. I would say it's a similar dynamic as the connection actually matters for it to actually be uh, dealt with. Another analogy would be cut a weed off at the top with the lawnmower versus get it out by the root. Mm -hmm. Because the, the words are powerful, but a heart that isn't behind them uh, removes their efficacy. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, I would just add a little bit to that, and it's in total agreement with what you said, yeah. which is the scripture talks about forgiveness mm -hmm. and then forgiveness from the heart. There's a difference, and, yeah. And I think our, our will begins the forgiveness process. Mm. But sometimes we can speak the words, I forgive you, without our will being yeah, engaged. That's true. Because our will is connected to our heart. Yes. 
But secondly, our heart also contains all the wounds that we're talking about and all the judgments and everything yeah. else. And so if we're, as you're saying, getting chopping off the top of the weed, it's just going to continue to grow and continue to be there, which is why sometimes we don't feel freedom from forgiveness or healing from forgiveness because we're not really going to the depths of the wound. Mm -hmm. And so the level of forgiveness needs to go to the depths of the wounds, which is why sometimes, as you said, we need to forgive over and over and over again the same person because it's going deeper and deeper and deeper into our heart mm -hmm. in the healing process. Awesome. Bob, step two, it's picture the person in front of you and pay attention to what you feel. Like what talk us through that. Yeah, and we'll do this in just a minute, but it's you know, just imagining the person brings up yes. it's more it it brings it down to the yeah, heart it level. It's 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 it keeps it from being abstract. Yep. And what do I really experience in the presence of this person? And even, you know, I'm not a very visual person. We've talked about this. You're more visual. So you could probably see the person. I just can get a sense of the person yep. when I try to imagine the person. So wherever people are in terms of their their ways of perceiving, yes. it's still helpful to imagine that person in front of them. Yes. And pay attention to the distance between you. Interesting. Because uh, sometimes the person is close and sometimes the person is far away. And that says something. That says something about your trust level sure with that person. Yeah. But it also, whether they're far or distant, also evokes a certain emotion. So what do you feel in that person's presence? Mm -hmm. Because the feeling is going to reveal the wound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to reveal at least the if, the impact of the wound, not, not necessarily the wound. What would you add? Yeah, there's a study that I remember from years ago where they had people, uh, I think it was, it was either a PET scan or a CAT scan or an MRI, I can't remember, but they were watching the neural activity. So what lights up when you actually wiggle your toes versus imagining wiggling your toes? And it was about 90% of, of similar neural activity. So just yeah. imagining the person in front of you activates a lot. So one of the reasons I love Catholicism is that we are a um, sacramental people. And what that means is that we love and honor that human persons are body and soul. We're, you separate those, it's called death. And so in mm -hmm. the midst of that, sacraments are very tangible. Why? Because it's human. God's relating to us as a human. And so we're doing the exact same thing here. We're trying to get all of our senses and memories and attention focused here because that's, like you're saying, more of us is present so that the process of healing can be more effective. That's why incense, like, you, and that's why there's bells at mass and stuff. And it's basically, we, we all have, is we're all Israelites. We all wander around, right? And so you're at mass and you're like looking at the lights and going, why did they put that there? Man, they need to repaint the wall or whatever. And then all of a sudden the bells ring mm -hmm. and you're brought right back through a sense that maybe you weren't using or a smell draws you in or a visual draws you in. And so that's why we're actually doing this is to activate more now some people might say uh bob jake i don't need any help being activated right <laughs> and so we would say yep you might not need to sit long in this particular step yeah. but i've had people who um so two things one people who are like you who aren't visual and go i can't see the person it's not working that yeah. could be normal it could just be that you're like bob and not very visual and I have other people go i don't want to see the person and so right. they're already, right. they're very similar to step one. They're already like, no, 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 no. I don't want to go. And so one of the things that you do in various trauma therapies is you, is you create an imaginary safe place. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you put a concrete wall between you and them and, and your imagination, if you need to, you put them inside. I've had people put them inside like a vault, like one person. I remember, you know, how like on superhero movies, they have these like indestructible <laughs> things they can't get out of but you can still see the person. So they're like, okay, I'm going to put them in that. And then I can at least be in the same room as them. And sometimes those help with people who've had really traumatic yeah. things. Or, or the other side of that is you can ask Jesus to be present with you or somebody else to be present with you there and be with both of you and be a protection. That's so good. In, in the middle of that. Yep. 
the the other thought that I had as you were talking about the the research with the the brain activity yeah. is there's another research of, that being in the presence of somebody and then measuring all the brain activity and there are actually different centers of the brain mm. the different parts of the brain where anger yeah and sorrow and shame and fear i mean they're all they all light up differently wow. and so you know literally as we're imagining you know putting together what you said mm -hmm. about the imagination being about 90% yep. of the reality yep. that that your brain is actually experiencing yep. the emotions at that point of being in that person's presence yes. and so even if there's resistance to pay attention to the resistance yep. because that's saying something that's that's illuminating it. Yeah, it's it's all information and data that's extremely important to the process. And that's part of what therapy is, is is having the capacity to know what information is important, what information isn't as important, and how to navigate it. It's like you're a guide, you know, walking up a mountain or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got step one, ask the Holy Spirit. Let's say we've got the person we, we've got the person in mind. Now we're picturing that person in front of you and paying attention to how we feel. Okay, let's say we've done that. Now we're at step three, make an account of the debt they owe you. Whew. What did they take from you? How did they hurt you? And it's okay to feel emotion here, particularly anger or whatever. So make an account of the debt they owe you. So this is one where like I, in the process, you know, when sister leads us in it, usually at the events, this one, you need to pause a little bit because this mm -hmm. is not meant to be cheap. Right. And, and okay. if you just go through, oh, you know, they trigger warning, like, oh, they just molested me. And, you know, that was it. Okay. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That was a, that's a major debt. That's a major grievance. We need to probably sit and let and notice what that did. Yeah. And what this is, is really honoring dignity, particularly your dignity, my dignity when I'm doing it. And it's not dismissing that it mattered what happened. Yeah, yeah. And if we go back to your car analogy from last mm -hmm. time, and I said the, this guy hit my car, but it wasn't bad, that would be a lot less debt, literally, than if what happened to my children's, my daughter and son-in-law's car, van, the big 14-passenger yeah. van that they had for eight years. Yeah that somebody ran into the side of it and because they can't fix it less than $30,000, their car is totaled. So they've lost their whole means of transportation and can't replace it at the cost that they yep. get. So the cost of somebody running into the side of their van is a much greater debt yeah. than the person who just hit the side of my car. And, and so as you were saying, you know, sexual abuse, as an example, yeah. has such a greater impact. And so the forgiveness is going to be that much more difficult yeah. for something that has that much of an impact. But we need to account for it and name it as best we can yes. and the consequences. And the consequences can be intense and severe. And so that's why this process is a process and not just an event. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. And again, uh, listeners, this can be hard. Like, so, you know, yeah, this is something that you you might need to give yourself a little bit of time to do. Sometimes people need to take breaks. Sometimes people need to do it with someone else physically in the room with them. When I've done this in therapy sessions before, my presence can be very because usually you're working with people who've had some of those more severe experiences, and this can be really really difficult. And so it's helpful to have someone else with them. You know, kind of that that physical present other person in the room can be really helpful. So you're taking an account of it. And then we go to step four, Bob. So imagine yourself telling them what they did to hurt you and how it has affected you. So yeah. whew, we keep turning up the volume here. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is not for the faint of heart. So Bob, various things come up for me, but what comes up for you here with step four? Yeah, I, I often, when I'm introducing this step, say and recognize that they're not going to hurt you right now as you share this. You're perfectly safe. Uh, this is not going to be in a, this is, you're safe to express it. There's nothing going to happen to you because you express mm -hmm. it. Uh, 
and then uh, you know what what comes up for me is oftentimes the difficulty of feeling and expressing the anger mm. you know i i want to go to mercy so quickly mm -hmm. i want i want to go to the to the oh, it's okay or i forgive you and sometimes it's hard for me to just stand in no, this really did hurt, and I really am angry, even if I've covered it over by a kind of a quick forgiveness. I, mm -hmm. I really have hurt here in places that I don't trust, and anger and sorrow and uh, fear and mistrust, as I said, and maybe other things that are connected here. And this has had an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't be forgiving if it didn't have an impact. Mm -hmm. And so just naming the impact for myself allows me to feel the consequences mm. of what's happened and to recognize that this is not cheap grace. Yeah. This is, you know, Jesus' forgiveness of us wasn't cheap grace. It cost him a lot. Yes. He suffered a lot. And that's why we have the image of the crucifix in Jesus. And that's constantly our focus because this wasn't a cheap gift mm -hmm. of love. Mm -hmm. it, it cost him everything. And our forgiveness also costs us something. Hmm. This particular step for me is, I might say, one of my favorite. It's yeah. because uh, you and I are a good complement because I do not have a struggle <laughs> with the wanting to forgive too quickly. What, what goes on in my imagination as I'm doing this, I get bothered because I'm afraid I'm sinning. Because in my, it can sometimes feel like a, you know, an R-rated gangster movie, like what I feel like <laughs> I want to do if I'm telling them, you know? And so then I, I kind of would, I often experience shame at this step because as I attempt to try to tell them, there's powerless parts of me that go, I, I, I'm not powerless anymore. It's time to let it all out. Yeah. And so we're kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum there and both have their own unique kind of dynamic. So I have to be careful, one, of like wanting to harm the other person and then feeling shame because I want to do that. Then the whole process starts shutting down and then a lie can come in, you know, see, you're just as bad as them. And, you know, like yeah. you're, you, why are you even doing this? You know, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, what, what, what that brings to my mind is as a therapist, oftentimes, and people would start to get into that and pull back, I would say to them, even if it's nonverbal, what you're, wanting to express have the freedom right now in your imagination because it's in your heart and it needs to come out and i will have people in those situations want to beat somebody to a pulp yeah. or wanted to shoot somebody or wanted yeah. to do, and i said let's just play it out in your imagination it's it's safe right here this is in your heart it's got to come out yeah this is part of the healing and i have seen people really get healed as they let that level of intensity out. Agreed. And then we deal with the shame of that. And then we deal with the other places. It's so, Bob, I appreciate you saying that because that's, I, I've, I've done the same in my therapeutic practice. Like I can remember probably one of the most traumatized individuals I've ever worked with. We were walking through this very process and this step, like we probably spent three, four sessions. Wow. on this particular thing because the amount of powerlessness and dynamic was so big and so much occurred and and i mean at some point it it we both started chuckling because it just got like i mean we were literally watching a gangster movie together you know and it was just like oh my goodness and and it, yeah. it, it but it was okay it wasn't like oh my like you're an awful person i, I, yeah. I was right there with the individual like I was right there with them and we were, we were right in the midst of it. And you're right. It, what was, what was powerful about that is we, we let it play out because here's the reality. I mean, if we're going to be honest, if you have that propensity to do that, this isn't the first time you've done it. Your mm -hmm. heart already goes there in other times. Why does that movie that you really like attract you so much because your heart's connecting to the possibility of not being powerless. Like, why do you like the superhero movie or why do you like it when the good guy wins or whatever that there it's all connected. So 
I, I think that's really valuable. And people can go like, whoa, whoa, you can't do that. That's wrong. It's Here's another way that I've been taught or told to do that is it's one more step here with step four is that notice the person and notice that if you can, this is not who they were designed to be. And mm-hmm. if you can try to separate their dignity and who they were designed to be and all of the evil that has come into them that isn't really them and yeah. pull that apart and let the good uh-huh. of them go to the side and then get after the evil that yeah. isn't them. And then we quote Paul, etc., and things like that. It's the sin. Which is hate what is evil. Yeah, hate what yeah. is evil. And, and hate what is yeah. evil. Yep. And so I've had some people go, oh, okay. Yeah, I can now yeah. do that. And so there's no mercy here for this. And so it right. it allows them to get a bit deeper in step four. So Yeah, which is then builds the right judgment. Right? There you go. That, like evil is evil. Yeah, period. And evil has evil consequences and bad consequences and they're damaging. Bob, I, I'm just imagining the listener right now who's possibly checked out. Can, can <laughs> we like, because of this whole concept of I thought you guys, I thought, right, I can almost hear the person in their car or on the walk and they're just going, you guys are saying that it's okay to be mean, right? I can yeah. hear the lie. Almost, and the reason I can hear it is I've actually heard it, right? <laughs> I've actually <laughs> worked in these scenarios with people. And I just want to yeah. pause and be sensitive to this because I think some people don't understand like what that has to be a problem that is sinful jesus says even if you commit adultery in your heart you've already sinned how are we not doing this i can't do this i can't go there and so my first response would be jesus also said if you cause one of these little ones to sin it would be better if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were thrown into the sea like that's a cinder block with a rope thrown off a boat, tugged to the bottom and drowned. Like that's the visual he's yeah. referencing. So yeah. hmm. what comes up for you there, Bob? And we can maybe, to that person who's going, I, I, I thought this was about forgiveness and you're saying that it's it's okay for me to be angry? No, it's not. Yeah. I, I would often, similar to what you said, I would do a couple different things. I would say, this is already there in your heart. We're just given permission for it to be expressed be- so that it can be released from your heart. Mm. And two, just take a minute and ask Jesus if it's okay for you to do yeah, this. That's good. Yeah. Uh, and invariably they get permission yeah. and go forward. Have you ever found that it's, uh, I, I, I'm imagining you have, this is where the healing process gets interesting you're walking a step four, imagine yourself telling the person what they did to hurt you and how it affected you and they can't. And what you're actually Mm -hmm. usually dealing with there is a vow. Yeah. I will never get angry like they got angry. Right. And so you're stuck and you can't move through it. And then the forgiveness is cheap because you're actually bound by your own vow. Yep. I've not only run into that as a therapist, I've run into that in my own heart. Me too. That's, that's a, a barrier that I have had to deal with is the vow that I won't be angry like those people that were angry that I'm trying to forgive. Right. Yeah. I won't be vulnerable. I won't talk to them ever again. I won't associate yeah. like all of that stuff is what locks this stuff up. And then you wonder, and this is to the practical application, then you wonder why you struggle in the relationship with somebody and you don't understand why. Well, you, you peel back enough layers of the onion and you go, oh my gosh, they remind yeah. me of the person who hurt me. No wonder I can't be around them. Yeah, and even though we don't have the renounce the vow in this process, at that point, if we were working with somebody, we would say, Jesus, would you show us what the barrier is here? That's good. And then a vow like that would come up. And then we would renounce that. Yeah. How about we move on to step five? Yep, great. Step five, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what you believe about yourself based on that incident. So right now, again, we're in the anatomy of a wound uh, the the second circle beliefs and there's two kinds of beliefs. This is the identity lies. So Bob, talk us through this one. Yeah, this is uh, what I was saying before. This is the place where it's often difficult to forgive because we've internalized from the other person's behavior beliefs mm-hmm. 
associated with those wounds. And so you've mentioned a lot powerlessness. Mm -hmm. So we've taken on this identity of powerlessness, and I don't have a voice, mm -hmm. and I can't speak up, and I can't do anything. Or uh, a belief related to rejection. I'm not lovable, and I'm not loved. And what your action told me reinforced this sense that I'm not good, and I'm not lovable, that I'm not wanted, and I'm not desirable. Or that it's reinforced some area of shame in my life. You know, like the way that you treated me hit right in this place that I'm already vulnerable hmm. in an area of shame in my life. And, and you've just humiliated me by your actions. And I'm stuck in this shame and I'm not even conscious of it. Hmm. I'm just conscious of what you've done, not how it's affected the way I see myself. And so what we're dealing with here is allowing the Holy Spirit to illuminate those places because those are part of the biggest consequences of the action is what we've held on to in terms of our belief. And identifying them and then being able to renounce them and then sometimes allowing Jesus to speak to our hearts in those places mm -hmm. uh, is a huge part of the healing process as we talked about before in the, the healing process. Yeah, the, my thoughts here is this is very normal God designed us to be meaning makers. And so when we yeah. walk through life, we interpret and put meaning to things. It's part of our dignity. But when that interpretation isn't true, it can lead us astray. When the interpretation is true, it's, it's blessing in life. Mm -hmm. And Bob, I think this is so important is that people often don't realize that when an incident happens, it, they get it with a kid, right? When, you know, mom and dad got divorced and the kid says, it must have been my fault. And mm -hmm. we go, oh yeah, well, my parents weren't divorced, so that didn't affect me. And and that's just, a, to be frank, that's an ignorant response to our lives that we don't have any identity lies because I don't have that one. It just assumes mm -hmm. that there's no other. So this is so important. Like, gosh, this is the real meat of forgiveness, why it's hard, why you're stuck, why you hold on to grudges, why you have the vows is because of the identity lies and where we're, where we're going next. So, Bob, you mentioned step five, and then you, you touched on step six, which is renounce the identity lie. And so this would be, I think we've, we have a, we've done a previous series where we talk about this, right? Isn't this the healing process? Like, yeah, yeah. it was in that. Yeah. So what, what, how does one do that? Can you give an example? Just in a very simple way, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce the lie that I'm powerless. Hmm. I renounce the lie that I can't do anything. I renounce the lie that I'm bad or I'm stupid or I'm ugly, or, yeah. you know, I, that I'm unlovable, that I'm alone, that there's nobody to help me. Whatever those yeah. identity lies are related to the wounds, we just, in the name and authority of Jesus, renounce them yes. and then announce the truth. And then sometimes we don't know the truth. We ask Jesus, what's the truth yes. here? That's good. Bob, why does that work? Well, a couple of reasons why it works. One is these areas become strongholds in our life, and they, the beliefs then get attached to demonic hmm. presence. Okay, And so what we're doing is we're taking the authority of our baptismal vows into, to be able to pray for deliverance for those areas of our hearts. Mm -hmm. But it's also breaking the agreement that we had, yeah. which is what allows that stronghold to exist. Whenever we make agreement with a lie, we then by our will join to it. Mm -hmm. And now we're taking our will and releasing yeah. the agreement that we made. Yeah. I, I think of it sometimes like a, a, our will is like a pen and we have a yeah. greasy used car salesman who slips a contract in front of us and goes... <laughs> you are yeah. bad or whatever. And we take one side of the pen and we sign it. And that's our willful assent to that being true. But what we don't realize is the pen flips to the other side and it erases that, yeah. that whole agreement where you say, no, I no longer agree with this. And you can take away that agreement. Our will is yeah. the center piece of that, that whole thing there. And the other thing I think people experience here a lot, myself included, is the critical commentary from the cheap seats when you're doing this. When you're renouncing a lie, there's almost always, or at least in my experience, there's almost always <laughs> like chatter. This isn't going to yeah. work. This is right. silly. 
nothing's going to change, et cetera, et cetera. And that if you just pause and can be aware of that internal chatter, what you're acknowledging is one, that could be a part of you that's afraid of what's going on or doesn't believe or whatever. More often than not, it's uh, what in discernment of spirits we would call the evil spirit, which can be discerned as the world, the flesh, or the devil, saying and trying to compromise the process because what does a bully not want to do when the big strong people come in? They don't want to leave. So they yeah. start chirping off and being like, well, you're not going to do it. You're a wimp. You're not going to whatever. And that's exactly what's going on is there is ground being taken back and the world of flesh and the devil do not want that ground to be taken back. So they start commenting on the process. And a lot of people stop right there as soon as they yep. hear the comment, like, oh, this is not going to work. Oh, I it, guess it's, it's not going to yeah. work. Yeah, it's not, it's real. not real. I, I think I've shared this before on the podcast, but I've had more than one person who were suicidal when they renounce suicide and hopelessness and despair. At the suggestion of it, they almost begin to mock it. Yep. That's so true. You know, and there's a mocking inside. This isn't going to make any. You have no idea. This is, this doesn't even touch this place. And then they renounce it, and all of a sudden they have this freedom from that that they say, "That's impossible." You know, I've been living with this. I thought these were my thoughts and feelings, yep. and wow, it's it's so true. Like uh, I'm going to weave together something here that might be a bit hard to digest. Um, I'll use these terms loosely. Our good friend, Father Justin, he, he'll probably correct me, but um, <laughs> we could almost call this a minor exorcism. And mm -hmm. what, what I mean by that is we, in our capacity as baptized sons and daughters, are saying, no, I, I, I get out. I don't want this. And as baptized Christians, we are children of God. Like if, if the prince or princess is walking around the kingdom and a bad guy comes, they have a lot of authority there. Like there's a lot of authority to be able to respond and do something in that. And so that's what we're doing here. We're operating as prince and princesses in the kingdom to be able to respond to these dynamics. So that, again, we're, we're getting down into the nitty gritty there of some of the commentary. Is, is minor exorcism even the right phrase? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, probably Father Justin would be better. I, yeah. I like to think of it as just simple deliverance. Deliverance, prayer. yeah. Uh, I don't but, know if we can do minor exorcisms as lay people. So don't, yeah, don't somebody know. will correct us on that. Probably our <laughs> friends who are exorcists will yeah. tell us. Yeah. And and I want to allow for the fact that it isn't all demonic. Absolutely. You know, some of it is disbelief. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're standing with our will and we're coming against this really strongly held belief. Yes. yes. Could we say at the same time, people often swing the pendulum to two extremes. And so what you and I do yeah. really well is balance, I think, those those pendulums. It isn't all demonic. And the demonic is sure present in trying to get at this stuff. And people are like, oh right. my gosh, like this is intense. Like this is just a basic reality of life. Like angels and demons are yeah. very real. They're just, they're, it's nothing to be terrified of. It, we have a lot of authority. It's just. You're right. And, and it's all in our baptism. Okay, so on to number seven. So as you're, if you're following along the process that like we're really zooming in, so we, we're, we're taking stock, what's going on, who was it? Then we're getting into the heart dynamics here. We're imagining the person. We've gone through one layer here, which is identity lies. And now we're going through the second layer of beliefs in the whole anatomy of a wound. So here we are with number seven, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the judgments you hold towards that person who hurt you. And then that goes to number eight. We'll connect these, renounce those judgments. So Bob, it's very similar to the one previous with identity lies. It's just the other part or the other type of belief. Is that right? Yep. And and here, uh, oftentimes people struggle with well, what's a, a good judgment and a bad judgment. Here? Yeah. Right judgment like our last series. Yeah. Right. And it may be that the judgments have validity. Sure. You know, like you are this, 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 and this. The problem is we're we're putting it onto the person's identity. That's key. Yeah. Okay. And the other problem is that we're not discerning right from wrong there and calling evil evil and good good. That we did that earlier. Mm -hmm. What we're doing here 
is we're standing in a place of pride, looking down and condemning the other person and defining the person by their sin. Mm. That's yes. That's where that's destructive. I hope our listeners can hear these nuances where, again, we're talking about beliefs, whether it be of ourselves or another person. And we're all, and you'll notice in the process, we're always upholding the dignity of the person throughout the entire process. And at the same time, we are asked to by truth himself to make right judgment and i love the nuance you just made there notice how the first one is identity lies about us the second one or judgments is kind of about identity lies as well it's just identity lies for the other person we're not throwing identity lies on them that's what a judgment is is that fair to say yeah that is fair to say yeah we're defining them by their actions towards us as though it's who they are, right? As a way of protecting ourselves. Should we give an example of a judgment um, versus, and I like a, ju- a good judgment and a bad judgment? So let's use the car analogy that we used last time. Like, okay, uh, what's something that comes to mind that's a good judgment? I, th- I, I know we mentioned them, but maybe we can label them now. Yeah, a good judgment is you took my car and you wrecked it, yeah. and it did a lot of damage. And that was careless of you. Right. Okay. Bad judgment is, I can't trust you with anything. You're careless. You, you're not capable of doing anything or handling anything. You're just a careless idiot. Notice how they flow together nicely <laughs> in, yeah. the, in the deceptions <laughs> of the heart. But one very much goes to you are this as opposed to this is what occurred, right? I think the classic thing is, Hate the sin, love the sinner is a very generic way of saying it. Yeah. 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 Ready for step nine? Uh, yeah. And and so when we renounce the judgment, it's the same thing as when we renounce the lies. Yeah. Right? It's just in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce it. And I invite people at this point to to really feel the judgment the way they experience it in their heart, not make it, not sanitize it, not make it polite. Yeah. But to really name the judgment the way it is. Yes and then renounce that judgment yes. in the name of Jesus. Bob, I really appreciate the That's very subtle what you're doing right there, but I think it's really important. And this, as well as the all the healing process, um, it is okay to get your hands dirty. Necessary. That I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, a, a friend of mine, a priest friend of mine said, virtue is, is messy business. Yeah. Because the process of becoming virtuous is not clean. It deals with sin and shortcoming and faults and failures. And that God isn't afraid of the mess. Like the the best analogy I've ever heard is by a friend of ours, Father Mark Toops, where he talked about Jesus rolling away the stone when Lazarus, like bat, the bad smell, like Jesus is not afraid of the stench. He presses into it, just like a good parent changing a diaper. Like this isn't pretty, but it's necessary for health, for life, etc. So I do, I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I remember somebody telling me that uh, they were asked by the Blessed Mother to share all of the images from pornography. And they said, no, I can't. You're totally pure. I can't do that to right. you. Wow. And she said, don't you think I changed Jesus' diapers? <laughs> <laughs> She's dealt with bleep before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's very true. And isn't it? I think that's just an important thing. We think that God in, in his holiness, which is true, can't handle unholiness or impurity. And I think our theology gets a little bit distorted because that's exactly what the incarnation is. It's Jesus and the cross. And the cross. It's it's a it's the skydive of skydives, like going right. right headlong, right into the darkness. And what what happens in the the uh, in, in the creed? We profess it every Sunday when we say the creed is like the descent into the dead. Yeah, Jesus is no faint of heart like oh i don't want to get my shoes dirty like that is not jesus at all right he it's more like a rescue mission than it is like a <laughs> like you know a prince who doesn't want to get his toes dirty you know yeah yeah which is why he ate with prostitutes and tax collectors and all of that's, us that's right? so good like, <laughs> and all of us yeah I'm, I'm right there with them at the table yeah okay so yeah. 
That's seven and eight, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal judgments and then renounce judgments. And now we're at step nine, ask Jesus to forgive the person. So interesting nuance yeah. here because it's kind of like, well, aren't I supposed to be forgiving? Like what, what, what's, yeah. so what, what gives, why, why are we yeah. bringing Jesus yeah. in here? Yeah. That's number 10 is, is us forgiving. Yeah. But number nine is usually we do in the meditation is invite the person to go to the cross with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And stand before Jesus at the cross. So there's a real, there's a real cost to forgiveness. Mm. And it's the cost that Jesus paid. And I usually invite people to stand with the other person and ask Jesus to forgive both of you. Wow. To forgive the person for what they've done to you yes. and to forgive you for the judgments and resentments and bitterness that you've held towards the person. Yes. A and yourself, maybe. And yourself. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, I said, and just hear him from the cross. What does he say from the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they mm -hmm. do. Just hear Jesus speak the words mm -hmm. and look at look at what he's experiencing. Yeah. I really like that nuance, Bob. And again, it 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 is what, you know, in the in the conferences. Again, it's another visual step of uh -huh. asking Jesus to forgive the person and going together with them to the cross. And, and that visual is really good when you go from step nine, how does Jesus respond into step 10, which is now forgive the person. And it, when you stay in that scene of the cross, it all has context. It, it's not like you're isolated and you're alone and you're the only one who's doing anything. When you're in that scene where first Jesus has forgiven, then the scriptures come alive. You're like, oh, right, he said this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Okay, like this makes sense in this context. So at, in step 10, I'm you know, probably similar to the other steps. I'm imagining that there's a bit of a, a, a way that they can say it. So I know for me, when I do this with people, I just say, say whatever you need to say mm -hmm. about forgiving the person. And often what I appreciate when I'm doing this with someone is if they can to say it out loud, because what I find happens, and this is might be people are like, oh dear, we're going back to a previous step where <laughs> someone will start forgiving out loud and then they actually start articulating more judgments and identity lies that they didn't articulate before. And then it's like one of those yeah. things where you're like, okay, nice, return back to step five yeah. and let's go back through <laughs> yeah. and, and do that a little bit more. Shoots, shoots and ladders, <laughs> yes. right? Let's go chat Dealing with shoots and ladders, that's so true. <laughs> oh, that's so true. Um, if your last name was Ladders, we could be shoots and ladders here. <laughs> Did you just make a dad joke? <laughs> Bob, that's maybe the best one I've ever heard. <laughs> okay, listeners, that deserves an Emmy nomination right there, Bob. <laughs> I'm sorry that I love dad jokes. Mine, I want my last name now to be Ladder so we can be shoots and ladders. <laughs> okay, sorry. That struck me as really funny. When, when I was a kid, we used to have friends that were ladderers. So we would play that game together shoots and ladderers. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Sorry. I actually have tears in my eyes right now. All right. So, uh, all right. We'll go back to for, is there anything else you would say with forgive the person or anything else you would do? I, I usually, if they're in this meditation, I have them as they're side by side in front of Jesus, now turn face to face, huh. and to look at the person and now speak the words that Jesus spoke from your own heart. Right. I forgive you. You really didn't realize what you were doing to me. Simple, eh? Like there's not like, it, again, you can say as much as you need to or until your heart's content. Um, usually uh -huh. when I'm with somebody, I'm watching for the pendulum to swing. I'm watching yeah. for the movements of the heart to go almost like sometimes people can start to grovel and shame themselves at this step. And then if I'm hearing that, I'll go, can we just, let's pause for a sec. What are you believing right now about yourself? Yeah. And then we yeah. might need to go back. Or, to or I can't forgive them. I just can't yeah. forgive them. And it's like, okay, so let's, let's ask, where's, where are you stuck? Yeah. And then, then that again brings you back down to another step. Exactly. And so here's a little advanced version of this 13 step process. I've had people before where by the time the process is over, they've got like four people at the cross. 
because they started with this one and then they were like, oh my gosh, it reminds me of this person. Like, well, let's bring them too, yeah. right? And then before you yeah. know it, they're like looking at these people who've had these significant impacts on them and they're forgiving all of them yeah, because they're all connected. So that's happened sometimes for me as well. And I'm like, yeah, the more the merrier at the foot of the cross. Yeah. 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 So step 10, forgive the person. And again, this can be hard again, watching for barriers. And it's a simple prayer of forgiveness. Notice in the sacraments that when it comes to the in, in the sacrament of reconciliation, the prayer of forgiveness is quite simple because it's just powerful. There's power in the words. And so there's no, you're not lingering long here. You're just, the power is in the words. Like I forgive yep. you. Yeah. And if it's connected to the heart and the will is engaged in it, it has impact, spiritual impact. Nice. Yep. And I could tell so many stories right here, mm -hmm. people's experiences of forgiving and the other person not knowing the forgiveness and the healing that takes place. Uh, so you know, one of them was a seminarian and he forgave his sister who had been unfaithful and ruined the reputation of the family. And so when the baby came, mm -hmm. the baby's sister, the sister had a baby. Every time the sister had to come over to do business, the baby would cry inconsolably wow. in the presence of the man. And after he forgave on a retreat, the sister came over with the baby and the baby jumped into his arms for the first time <laughs> and was totally content the whole time. Wow. Now, how do you explain that? Uh, yeah, I think, I think go back through the process. That's the, there's the, all those, all that dynamic is there. Like people know, people yeah. know the kids are perceptive. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's a spiritual reality to this. that's way beyond that's very true. in mystery. Yeah, that's very yeah. true. Yeah. Okay. Step 11, yeah. pray yeah. then. So step 11 now, we've just forgiven the person, pray a prayer of blessing over that person. Ask God to bless them in the opposite way that they hurt you. Whew. So if you haven't done yeah. steps one to 10, <laughs> 11 is hard, almost yeah. probably impossible. So, But this is one of the measures that your heart has really gone through the other 10 steps because there's a, there's a freedom and there's a desire so now true. to speak to that person's identity in the very opposite way that you judge them. It's like this joy of saying, you know, you're not that person that I've judged you to be. You're this person that God says that you yeah, are. That's so good. Yeah. The, the, I loved how you said that. It's a measure. This is a real good check of the heart, right? Yeah. The measure with which you measure will be measured back to you. You and I, you and I joke about this when we play Farkle, but anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But the, this is a kingdom principle. And so there is power to bless and there's power to curse. That, yep. That's the story you just said about the baby, right? That That's yep. the, the reality of that lived out in real life. And so the blessing of another person brings life. I heard one person say, blessing is asking God to infuse the person with himself. It's like, mm -hmm. come God into them. Yeah. Yep. Blessing is the nature of God. Yeah. Yeah. So it's inviting God into them. And again... I find this, uh, so if you follow along in the scenes of the scriptures and in the Paschal Mystery, Jesus' Passion, Death, Resurrection, and Ascension, I find here it's nice to shift now the scene to resurrected Jesus. Yeah. And let yeah. blessing come with resurrection. So maybe you're in an upper room scene now, and Jesus is with you and he says, peace be with you. Yeah. And we're together now in this scene blessing this other person. Come, put your finger in my side. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Like blessing and life, you're good. I see you as you are. Yeah. So what would you say to somebody who says, oh, that's all make-believe? Yeah, the, the reality would be, it'd be a little bit of a, let, let's rewind the philosophical tape a little bit. And I would say, similar to the, well, uh, sorry, I'm thinking of other episodes, but to make it simple. <laughs> Not everything that is real can be seen in a biological slash medical matter uh, way. That's called biological reductionism. And there are realities and entities that are beyond scientific observation. That, and, and that's a philosophical truth and principle. There's a lot of thought, et cetera, put into this. But I think a lot of people go, what? That's crazy that the only things that are true are 
things that are scientifically verifiable. That's actually a logical fallacy. But anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. Um, I'm not avoiding it. I'm just saying for the sake of time. Yeah. Yeah. So my first thought would be there are things that are real that aren't seen in the ways that we would imagine. So example, how do you know that the Eucharist is changed? Right. Or the Eucharist is called confected. How do you know that that shifted? Here's here's another one that's very very simple. How do I know that China exists? Mm. I've never been to China. I mm. personally have no verifiable evidence of China in my world. And people are like, "Come on, that's stupid." I've been to China. Well, that would be, and I would have to trust your word. Yeah, I have this right. thing from China, right? Well, that would like be me showing you a relic. Right. So it becomes very comparable very quickly. I haven't yep. seen it. I've never touched it. I've never been there. I trust the testimony of other people and things that they show me. And I can see the impact of China and other things that I see. That's yeah. It. yeah. What comes up for you? That was a long way to way to get there. No, that's great. Uh, you know, just same thing we talked about in terms of healing prayer is imagining Jesus real. Well, if the Holy Spirit's working, yes. Hmm. And that real has real consequences. And just like the wound has real consequences, this whole process has real consequences. Yeah. And so when we are entering into it and we can see and feel and experience and the people around us can experience the freedom that comes, yeah. like the baby and the sister yeah. and the man himself, then we know that it's real even if it wasn't observable. I would say for me that the the this is zooming out a little bit, probably the most palpable evidence or in the biblical language fruit that I see with all of this healing process stuff is that when I renounce vows, hmm. it it's shocking to me at times hmm. because it can take me a while to go, oh my gosh, I think I'm operating in a vow. And then all the chatter starts, well, that's stupid. You're not going to do anything. Don't. Yeah. But when I actually engage, it's amazing. I literally physiologically feel different yeah. emotions shift and i'm like this is crazy it's almost every time yeah. that i do it i go this is nuts yeah. so wow. that is a palpable experience but I, you know somebody would go what are you doing and i would say I, i'm i've shifted something's different i'm not yeah. the same i'm not angry like i was a minute ago or whatever yeah and i would say that forgiveness would be another place that the that the fruit is palpable when it's real forgiveness. I agree. That it changes hearts and dynamics and health. I was thinking about being in Brazil and I, all of the healing, even all of the physical healing as well as all the emotional healing experiences that I had in Brazil, and it was a lot mm -hmm. of them, 90% had forgiveness associated with it. And the healing didn't happen until the forgiveness happened. And then I saw the physical evidence of the healing. Wow. Of the forgiveness in the physical healing. That is it. That's the car one with the girl that you'd mentioned in a previous. That episode. was one of them, but there were several yeah, of them. There yeah. was there was a guy that had had been brought in. He couldn't walk, uh, and a, got the bullies gang had beat him up, and wow. he was injured. And we were praying for his healing, and his healing didn't come. And we said, "Lord, what's the barrier?" And the Lord said, "Unforgiveness." And so I said to him, hey, "Did you forgive the people who did it?" I can't do that. Hmm. Uh, Okay, so we walked him through the process of forgiveness and we prayed for his healing. He jumped up and started walking. <laughs> yeah, and, and people are like, come on, that's on those weird Sunday morning TV shows. But the, no, that's called the kingdom. That's called the yeah. kingdom. I mean, it, it happened in the Gospels all, all the time. time right? and, and the cool. Jesus forgave the man before that's he right. got him off the mat. Son, your right? sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. Yeah. Right. It's like, yeah. here's the here's the recipe. Yeah, it's it's so good. So. So we're, we've done step 11 here, praying a prayer of blessing. Now, 12 and 13 feel almost like the cabooses of a train, like is it really necessary? Yeah. But they are. It's, it's, it's very important. So step 12, ask Jesus to seal this forgiveness and heal the wounds. And then 13, thank God for his healing. Talk. Yeah. What's going on there, Bob? We try to do this at the end of every healing prayer, which is seal what's taken place. Yep. Uh, and sometimes I'll have people just next time you go to communion, just pray for Jesus to seal this by his precious mm -hmm. blood or uh, ask Jesus to just affirm in you mm -hmm. the healing that's taken mm -hmm. place. And then the second part is like the lepers who come back and only one of them thanks yeah. Jesus for his yeah. healing. It's like 
this is the important part because what's what's the ultimate healing? The ultimate healing is our relationship with Amen. God. Okay, and so as we're thanking Him for the healing, we're getting our focus back in the right place. Yes. You know, He's been in part of all of this, but now we're coming back and saying thank you. This is the work that you've done. Yes, and we're grateful. Yeah, the for me, step twelve. What's uh, well, twelve and thirteen, but twelve particular. The ceiling to me is also a spiritual reality. That there, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of like imagine surgery. You've opened up some stuff, and what you're doing is you're properly putting it back together so infection doesn't come in post surgery. And so Jesus's yes. principles here were pretty simple. Like, yeah, you, you can get rid of one. Yeah, he references demons, and then seven more come back and take their place. Um, that that's a reality where if you're not like putting all this under the authority of Christ, there there are realities outside of the authority of Christ. Why? Because our will matters. Mm -hmm. We whatever we have authority over is what you would what you could call our kingdom. But when we surrender that authority to Jesus, it comes under his kingdom and it comes with all the rights and privileges of his kingdom versus our kingdom. And then if our kingdom, you expect war, like, it, you know, it's, it's just, a, again, a basic principle. But if you put it under Jesus's kingdom, it's kind of like, eh, I'd, I'd rather not mess with that. Or I, I just don't have authority here. Yep. I can't do anything. I'm impotent right. here. You know, right. the, those really matter in the spiritual realm. They do. Yeah. Really then I would do. say 13 for, for Thanksgiving, like St. Um, Ignatius of Loyola, uh, who does the discernment of spirits. I mean, uh, yeah, did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah, St. Ignatius, yeah. Uh, what the discernment of spirits says that gratitude is one of the most critical pieces of the spiritual life. It activates the life of God in us unlike anything else. And so really we're just kind of like, we're putting gas on the fire here, the good fire, and we're just letting it burn brighter and deeper with thanksgiving and gratitude. Yeah, so. and, and Henry now and I often talks about healing is moving from the bitterness to the gratitude. So listeners, we, we referenced earlier that we were going to guide you through a prayer. We have something even better. We would like you to go, we're going to put it in the show notes. And so maybe the one time ever you look at the show notes, but we're going to put a link to Sister Miriam James Heidlin leading people through this process. Over at the Abiding Together podcast, uh, she offered this as a resource and it's you can get it free on YouTube. It's really, really beautiful. So we're going to let her lead you through this particular process of forgiveness. So the, again, that link will be in the show notes. So check that out. Bob, any final thoughts here? Yeah. Well, the other thing is, uh, speaking of Sister Miriam. Oh, yeah. She will be our guest next, next time. She will. Leading into healing through the Holy Family. So yeah. if you hear her there, uh, you'll get to hear her again next time. Yeah, very true. Listeners, we're grateful for you. We really hope that, the, you know, th this is an episode where it's one tight, confined explanation of this prayer for forgiveness. And so you you might, you know, you keeners out there or you you people who sit in the front of class idea, you can type this out and then you have this little tool to be able to go, okay, I need to go through this. And, and Bob, after some time, it starts to come pretty quick and automatic if you mm -hmm. get used to it. But this is a nice little thing to be able to do in a prayer time. And I, I would, so priests, here's one final thought for priests. Imagine having a penance service or a, a healing service for forgiveness where you walk people through this process and then they all get to go to confession and bring all of this stuff into the sacrament of confession. Like watch out, buckle your seatbelts. Right. Like that's a right. powerful thing for maybe it's a community that's been devastated by something and, and yeah. you invite people in to a, a healing forgiveness service where you walk through these 13 steps, then everybody gets to go to confession and then maybe have a time of prayer or, or something after. So. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That's inspired. Yeah, I, th I think that could be cool. So try it out. Let us know how it goes. So thanks so much. And next time, Sister Miriam James and Shoots and Ladders, we will be there. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you guys later. <laughs>